lights, camera, action. <laughs> all right, I think I'm live. Uh, so hello everyone. Hope you're all having a fantastic week and happy Friday. My setup's a little bit different today, isn't it? Because we're gonna be doing something a little bit different. So uh, rather than a yoga class, we're actually gonna spend a little while exploring the system of yoga as a whole. So I suppose this is a philosophy talk. <laughs> Who am I, right, to be giving a philosophy talk? Uh, there are people that are, are much uh, better equipped to be sharing these ideas with you, but at the same time as someone who teaches yoga, I think it's important that I also share this knowledge so that you're aware as a student that there's a lot more that goes into yoga than just the postures, just you know what we do in a gym, what we do in a studio. So that's what we're going to be exploring today and this is going to be a mini series. Every Friday we're going to spend half an hour exploring the eight limbs of yoga. Ashtanga yoga. <laughs> Uh, now you cannot, oh well, yeah, I'm just gonna have a drink of water. I've actually got some notes here, just so that I don't miss anything important. I've got a couple of books I'll be recommending at the end. Maybe some quotes to share with you as well. Uh, it's very uh, it's very different. The weather's not great at the moment, so if, uh, if the connection goes, that'll be why. <laughs> if my camera loses focus, we're just gonna roll with it. Right, so here we go. Before we actually get into this, I just want to preface it by saying that everything that I'm going to talk about today obviously is my interpretation of, uh, of the texts I've read. You may have a very different opinion and that's absolutely fine. The beauty of what we're doing now is that it is open to interpretation. There's meant to be a conversation and a discussion about it. This is just my views. Uh, I will do my best for pronunciation as well of the Sanskrit words. They do trip me up sometimes, so I apologise in advance if I butcher them. Now we can get on with it. You cannot talk about Ashtanga Yoga without talking about this book here. <laughs> I'm just going to flip. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Now this is pretty much a staple book on every shelf of every yoga teacher, of every yoga student, or anyone that's looking to expand their knowledge of yoga. So that's the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Now, no one really knows when it was written. Some people say it was as early as 500 uh, BCE. Other people say it's as late as 500 CE. So there's a really big scope there of when it could have been produced. And also people don't quite know who wrote it. <laughs> Some people think it was a single man, Patanjali. Other people think it's more likely to be a group of people. So a collation of, of a group's knowledge. And I kind of lean towards the latter but who knows either way that's the time frame that's the the author <laughs> uh, it faded into obscurity for a little while and then it was revived in the 19th century and like i said it's become a staple book for anyone who's looking to learn more you're just gonna have to be i have to think about what i'm uh, what i'm saying so there's a wealth of knowledge in this book um, but one of the things we're going to be talking about is, is one of the systems of yoga that it introduces. And there's two systems of yoga that it talks about, Kriya Yoga and Ashtanga Yoga. We're not going to talk about Kriya Yoga today, but Kriya Yoga just very briefly composes of three parts, Tapas, Discipline, Svadhyaya, Self-Study, and Ishvara Pranidhana, which is Surrender. And there's various levels of Pranayama, Mantra, Mudra, that kind of stuff. But we're going to focus more on Ashtanga Yoga today. And Ashtanga Yoga is the the eight limbed path so there's eight parts of ashtanga yoga and this isn't to be confused with ashtanga vinyasa yoga so if you went to a gym if you come to one of my classes and we do ashtanga it's the set sequence the sun salutations the standing postures uh, the seated postures that's Ashtanga Vinyasa, and that was created by someone called Patabi Choi. It's different to the Ashtanga Yoga that Patanjali speaks about, and I think that's an important distinction to make. So you can practice Iyengar Yoga, Hatha Yoga, Yin Yoga, or another form of postural yoga, and as long as you incorporate the eight parts of Ashtanga Yoga, you're practicing a form of Ashtanga <laughs> Yoga. So uh, I hope that makes sense to you. So that's that. It's important because that's something I was really confused about. I thought Ashtanga Yoga was just the postures, right? I didn't realise at first when I first started practising that it was this bigger system. So important not to get confused. And uh, 
I'm not doing a history lesson on the Yoga Sutra. <laughs> Definitely not equipped to do that. But I recommend reading this because it is just a wealth of information. Um, yoga existed way before this book as well. This is just a collection of a much older oral uh, tradition of yoga. I've heard it described as the first self-help book, <laughs> which I don't know what you feel about that, but um, I kind of liked it. So yoga existed way, way, way before, before this text was written, but it's, you know, one of the first times, one of the first instances where almost a manual was put down on paper just to make it more accessible for people. All right, so that's it. I think I covered everything there. So don't get Ashtanga yoga as described in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, confused with Ashtanga Vinyasa that was created by Patabi Joy. There are two systems of yoga in this, Kriya Yoga and Ashtanga Yoga. Ashtanga Yoga means eight limbs, just in a little recap here. So eight parts, the whole, all of the parts practiced together is yoga and then no one really knows when it was written. Nobody really knows who it was written by. Bit of a mystery. So that's just a little brief, brief, brief outline of uh, where Ashtanga yoga comes from. Now, we are going to be in each part every Friday exploring one of the limbs. I'm gonna quickly run through the limbs uh, and, and the uh, translation. So yamas, the first limb, means restraint. So it's the moral don'ts of yoga. <laughs> uh, niyamas are the moral do's, they're observances. Then you have asana, the third limb, which is your posture. So the stuff that we do in the studios, the gym, it's just a small part of, of a bigger system. The fourth limb is pranayama, so breath control. Again, you may have come across this in the classes you do. The fifth limb is pratihara, which is sense withdrawal. The sixth limb is dharana, which is concentration. The seventh is dhyana, which is meditation. And the eighth is samadhi, which is pure contemplation. I mean, I've heard it described as enlightenment, <laughs> but you know, probably pure contemplation is, is a better way to describe it. So they're the eight limbs. So the first two, the yamas and niyamas, concern, um, you know, how we live our lives, what we, think about ourselves, how we treat others, the way we conduct ourselves, our emotional behaviours, our physical behaviours, our spiritual behaviours. I want to stay away from religious terminology because yoga isn't a religion, it's a system. It's been described as a science. It can be practised by people of all religions. But it is quite helpful to think of the yamas and niyamas as the Ten Commandments also, <laughs> uh, kind of as of yoga. So the yamas and the yamas are what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. Asana, obviously posture, self-explanatory, pranayama, breath work, self-explanatory. And the last four we just went through concern meditation. So they're kind of the, the steps you take as you work your way up towards that. Um, and I, I don't know whether originally they were supposed to be followed in order, that first of all you sorted your conduct out, then you got the postures, then you got the breath, then you got the meditation. I actually think, I suppose it makes sense for sure, because the postures, um, you know, I, I personally find the breath work and the meditation a lot harder than the postures, so that would seem like a natural progression. Traditionally, you do your postures so you can sit in a comfortable seat to meditate, so maybe they were meant to be followed in an order, but nowadays I kind of feel like we need to approach it a little bit more holistically, and especially with the first two, yamas and niyamas, it's an ongoing thing. They're things that you're going to have to be working on throughout your entire life as well as me. It's hard to uh, you know, be non-violent all the time. It's hard to be truthful all the time. These aren't things that can be ticked off and then set aside and then you're done. You can move on to the postures. The yamas and the niyamas are things you're gonna have to be working at forever, <laughs> myself included. Okay, so they're the eight limbs. They're the eight limbs of yoga and I'll write it down in the post uh, above this video. So hopefully that makes sense. I'll be doing some recapping. I feel like I'm getting into the swing of things. So I'll be doing some recapping as we go out. So just to recap very quickly, you've got your yamas, your niyamas, asana, pranayama, pratihara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi eight limbs of yoga. So we're just going to be focusing on the first limb today, the yamas. So the uh, restraints, the moral 
don'ts of yoga. <laughs> and uh, at first glance, they seem pretty self-explanatory, but actually they're very confusing. The more you dig into them, the more sort of moral conundrums they, uh, they bring up. And at times, they can be conflicting. So while you might want to follow one of them, you might find something else is, <laughs> is bashing up against it, and we'll explore that in a minute. So often uh, conflicting, often misunderstood, I feel, and uh, definitely propose some interesting questions about the way we live our lives. So there are five yamas. The first one, ahimsa, non-violence or non-harm. The second one is satya, truthfulness. The third one, asteya, non-stealing gets a little bit a little bit all over the place the fourth one brahmacharya or brahmacharya i've heard it pronounced both ways celibacy <laughs> i'm gonna go with the original meaning perhaps celibacy but often uh, nowadays it's seen as a non-distraction or a refocusing of energy and we'll explore that in a little bit and then the fifth one aparigraha non-possessiveness or non-greed. So I've always found the last two to be a little tongue twisting. So we have Ahimsa, Satya, Asteya, Brahmacharya, and Aparigraha. They're the five Yamas. And now we're just gonna break them down and have a little chat. <laughs> this definitely works better in like a Zoom setting where we can have a little discussion. But I'm gonna just run through what they mean. Some of the uh, problems and sort of complexities of them, how they apply to our practice on the mat, how they apply to the practice off the mat, and I've got a couple of quotes as well that I may even read, <laughs> like a teacher teacher. Okay, so the first one, Ahimsa, non-violence, non-harm. Self-explanatory seems all right, doesn't it? I think most of us would consider ourselves as non-violent creatures. <laughs> so perhaps we don't go out of our way to hurt other people. We're not violent. We don't get in fights on a Friday night after a few drinks. Most of us would consider ourselves as non-violent beings. However, what about all the times on the yoga mat that you have pushed past your point of comfort? All the times on the yoga mat, myself included here, where you've injured yourself because you're doing a posture that you know, deep down, you're not quite ready for. Is this or is this not violence? I would say it is. <laughs> so Ahimsa isn't just about not being violent to other people, it's also about not being violent to yourself. And that's a lot trickier. Um, it's a lot trickier when we practice yoga on the mat, physically and also mentally. If you can't get into a posture, what kind of thoughts come up? Uh, I'm rubbish, I'm no good at this. If you, you know, that's not just on the mat. We, I would say most people have those kind of thoughts. So that's kind of negative self-talk that interrupts the daily flow of our life. And that is a violence towards ourselves. In yoga, we call them samskaras, psychological imprints. Uh, usually caused by something that's happened years and years ago. And even if it's happened 20 years ago, it still has the ability to impact our behavior and get us stuck in these sort of negative self-talk cycles. Not easy to break free from samskaras, I'm not an expert on it, but I suppose the first thing to do would be to identify them, to realize the feeling is real, but then to understand that the beliefs you have about yourself are just that, beliefs and assumptions rather than actual facts. So whenever these negative sort of thoughts come up, uh, samskaras, you need to question the validity of them for sure. And that's the process of starting to undo them. So yeah, ahimsa, not just about the violence towards others, it's about the violence we show ourselves as well through negative self-talk and also um, through you know our physical practice. So that's one part of it. Another part of it that is often misunderstood, I've picked a big one, I and mean, to be fair, it's the first one, but this is quite a big one to start with. Non-violence doesn't mean complacency. I, I cannot be any clearer about this. Non-violence doesn't mean shying away from difficult conversations. It doesn't mean denying sadness. And non-violence is not apolitical, all right? 
have a moment to think about that. <laughs> we enter into the territory of spiritual bypassing now, toxic positivity. So some people within the yoga community um, will avoid the difficult conversations, they will avoid getting political, they will avoid uh, healthy debate and, and healthy back and forth and uh, in the name of Ahimsa because they don't want to get in an argument because they see the argument as being harmful. It's complete bullshit. <laughs> I'm just going to say that now. So while I was just talking about Ahimsa being uh, an internal practice, it is also a community practice. It works on a microcosm and a macrocosm. Let's just say what's happening at the moment with Black Lives Matter. You cannot practice a hymn and not get involved in that. You, ha you have to stand up for people that are being discriminated against. You have to stand against prejudice, sexism, um, you know, for people who are more vulnerable. You have to stand up and fight for those who are in the most vulnerable spaces. That is an ahimsic practice. It's difficult for me to talk about and, and, and sort of verbalize it because I feel so strongly about it, but ahimsa is political, okay? It's not ignoring anger, it's not ignoring politics, it's not brushing things to one side because it would be easier it is actively getting involved in your communities and making sure that you are actively working uh, towards non-violence for those in, in a more sort of a disadvantaged position than yourself, okay? So it works on a community level as well, and I think it's important to say that. <laughs> um, the big V is another thing. It's the last thing I really want to talk about when it comes to Ahimsa. So we've spoke about Ahimsa in terms of not being violent to others, not being violent towards yourself, in, in thought or action. We've talked about Ahimsa as being a political process, so standing up for those who are in a less uh, privileged position than yourself. And now we're gonna talk about it in terms of veganism, the big V. I think this is another thing that people need to just step back from a little bit. Um, wrongly, I'm gonna say this, wrongly, Ahimsa is equated as just being veganism. So a lot of people, well, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you're not harmful to the environment, you're not harmful to the animals, that's Ahimsa, my work is done. Not the case. Veganism is, of course, Ahimsic. It is a very non-violent way to, uh, to eat, to treat the environment, uh, you know, to treat your body as well. Plenty of great plant products in you. I'm sure it's gonna <laughs> make a difference to your health. But that is not the be all and end all. Your, your Ahimsa cannot stop there. It, it can't do that. And also, um, veganism doesn't work for everyone, okay? So this is where the problems start arising. And I'll use myself in this example as someone who has recovered from an eating disorder. So for me, what is more, for me personally, what is more Ahimsic? Veganism, where I believe strongly that starting to cut out food groups could potentially lead to worsening mental health, worsening physical health, or non-veganism, where I know I'm in a comfortable place now and that I'm fueling myself and that I can give back and start working at Hymnsic practices in other ways. Yeah, you see where the confusion is starting to come from. So it's not as easy as saying that veganism is a himza. Of course it is a himzik, but for some people it's not going to work for them and their body. For some people it's not going to make them feel good. And you, you know, you're ignore if you're going to say veganism is a himza, then you're also ignoring all the socioeconomic factors that play into whether or not people can get that kind of food. Uh, financially, food deserts, people being time poor. So you have to look at everything holistically before you come to that conclusion. All right, I feel like I've said what I need to say about Himza. Again, these are all just my opinions. Everyone's gonna have a different opinion about stuff, but that's the way I uh, look at Himza. So just to recap very quickly, Himza is non-violence, non-harm. It means that you are not violent in action or thought towards others or yourself if possible. It means that you treat your body with respect on your yoga mat, so you're not pushing yourself to the point of injury. It is political, so it works on a community level. It means that you are working actively 
uh, to help those who are more disadvantaged live a more non-violent and non-harmful life, as in experiencing that themselves. And it is also not necessarily just about diet. All right, I feel like that's everything. <laughs> So that's a himsa, the first one, and it's loaded, you know. You could have debates with people and, and discussions with people for hours about what a himsa means, and it's gonna vary from, from person to person. But I think if I could just have you take away one thing, it would be the political statement that um, a himsa isn't just burying difficult conversations and not getting angry and not actively working towards social justice. In fact, to be a himsic, you do need to be put in the work in to make sure this works is a safer place for everybody not just yourself all right bam mic drop okay so let's move on uh satya honesty whoa all right so um just like ahimsa i would say that most people consider themselves to be honest and trustworthy people most people, probably not everybody, but most people, you know, would generally consider themselves to be pretty honest. However, what about white lies? What about the small lies we tell every day? It's really a part of our social decorum. Oh, I'm, I'm only going to be five minutes late when in fact you're 25. Or you call in sick to work maybe <laughs> because you just need a bit of a wellness day, you need a break that's still a lie, okay? So this is where this gets tricky. Where do you draw the line? What lies are okay? What lies aren't okay? Are any lies okay? Does it depend on someone's circumstances or, or should we just sort of blanket it out? And this is where I have a, have a quote for you. And I'm gonna read it, okay? Let me find it. Okay, so this is a quote by the Buddha by Buddha, he said, one should speak only that word by which one would not torment oneself nor harm others. That word is indeed well spoken. So one should speak only that word by which one would not torment oneself nor harm others. That word is indeed well spoken. So the way I interpret that is that if you're gonna tell a lie, <laughs> You should, you should, let me, let me, let me just step back. So the thing is, is that with Satya, it often crosses into the territory of Ahimsa. So we were just talking about white lies, okay? So let's just say that your best friend says, what do you think of this dress? And you absolutely hate it. And you turn around, like the Buddha's saying, think about being well-spoken, think about being compassionate and say, it's not something I would personally uh, choose. I think that perhaps this dress might even look, might look even better on you. So you've told the truth, but you've done it in a very Buddhist, well-spoken way. Now that is very different to your friend not asking you if you like the dress, not asking for opinion, and you turning around saying, I actually really hate what you're wearing. You look hideous. Both of them are honest but one is delivered in a, a more compassionate way. So perhaps this is where the difference lies, the delivery of the truth. Um, whether the truth, whether telling the truth is going to be harmful, whether it's done in a, uh, you know, in a hymnic way or not, whether it's uh, delivered in the right way. And maybe that's the difference. <laughs> We also have to remember that the yamas are restraints. So in this sense, satya as a restraint, truthfulness as a restraint. So not going out and just telling everyone what you think of them in a very sort of like awful way, but being restrained with how you deliver that truth is, is gonna make all the difference. And that's the way um, I like to think of it as well. So we can also talk a little bit about intention. So what is your intention when being truthful. Is it to deliberately hurt somebody? So are you telling your friend that she looks absolutely hideous in that dress because you don't actually like her that much? Or are you telling her that you don't like the dress because you honestly feel like she would look amazing in something else and she's not, you know, she, she has so much more potential with the dress thing. <laughs> so what's your intention in telling the truth? Another um, 
you know, a really sort of difficult example is let's just say you had a friend and their partner was having an affair and you knew about it. Do you tell the friend? What's your intention in telling the friend? Is it to hurt that person or is it because you think she deserves better? How do you tell the friend? Do you do it in a very sort of blunt way that's going to cause trauma or do you restrain yourself and make sure your word is well spoken? So these are all these sort of really, really difficult conversations that the Yamas bring up. And then if we apply Satya, honesty, to our time on the mat, much like Ahimsa, how many times have you pushed your body and got an injury? Um, you've got to be honest with yourself in your practice and it's really hard. So these two, Ahimsa and Satya, go hand in hand, but also they kind of conflict a little bit because sometimes telling the truth is really hurtful. <laughs> but um, much like Ahimsa, be honest with yourself on the mat. Is your body ready for this posture? Um, is there something else that would probably be more beneficial to do? Are you practicing enough? Are you practicing too much? All questions you've got to ask yourself. Uh, so Satya is a, a, I actually really love Satya. I really love the idea of truthfulness because, and there's a lot of complexity that goes into it. We've just discussed some of them, but yeah, at the end of the day, it is about being honest to the best of your ability in a well spoken and restrained manner, not actively going around spouting your truth and telling everyone what you think of them, but um, being, being really sort of mindful of your words and having good intentions when you present that truth and as well as being honest with yourself about your practice and other areas of your life all right <laughs> so that's that yeah and now we're moving on to Asteya. i'm glad i put these notes down because i was like oh quote where's the quote Asteya non-stealing another tricky one because i think we'd all consider ourselves not to be thieves <laughs> we don't go around stealing other people's possessions and most of us don't anyway but we do steal so we steal the air we breathe we steal the food we eat we're stealing from the earth all the time cutting down forests and build flats <laughs> bad example but you know what i mean so we we are thieves to live we must steal that is not one of my original quotes but it is a quote i heard that i really love to live we must steal so how do we offset the fact that we are tremendous thieves <laughs> we give gratitude and we try and give back so um you try and give back to community projects you try and give back to the environment where you know whether that is eating vegan in a vegan way or whether that is uh, donating to specific like i said specific projects whether that's planting trees whether that's having a garden and trying to live more off your own land if you're lucky enough to have a garden or just or just whether it's having conversations with people about gratitude and about you know i want to come back to social justice again environmental justice all, all climate change everything like that so to live we must steal and one way that we can offset that stealing is by being grateful and is by giving back in a plethora of of different ways so as well as stealing from the land <laughs> what about energy vampires you might be one you might know one so Estella doesn't just concern stealing physical things, it also concerns stealing other people's time, stealing other people's energy. Um, and I'm pretty sure we probably all know someone like that. Whenever you're around them, you just feel absolutely drained. Now this is them stealing your energy. We all have to be mindful of it though, and especially when we come to relationships like give and take, like is the relationship 50-50 most of the time? Sometimes it's gonna be 80-20 if someone's having a bad day. Sometimes you're gonna be that 20, but it works both ways. So are the relationships you're having, whether that's romantically or uh, friendship-wise, are they balanced? You know, are you stealing other people's energy? Are you stealing other people's time? And we really do need to treat other people um, with more respect in that regards, I think. So yeah, the give and take in relationships, giving back for all you have taken in whichever way you can. And uh, yeah, stay, I feel like it's probably one of the more straightforward ones, but it still pro um, proposes those moral conundrums as well. Like, when is it okay to steal? Let's just say Starbucks are always paying their tax 
Is that really comparable to someone who's homeless who has stolen a sandwich from Tesco's? <laughs> All right, is stealing just stealing? This is why you can't take the, the Yamas um, individually. You do need to have a look at them as a system. They all work together as, as a beautiful whole. All right, so um, there are those questions there as well. But I think it's one of the more straightforward ones. Personally, I found it easier to understand than Ahimsa and Satya, but you might be different. So we're going to move on now to Brahmacharya, abstinence. <laughs> okay, so this one I get angry about sometimes um, because there's a lot of very creative interpretations of this um, Yama when in fact it translates to abstinence, celibacy, that's what it means. But you have to understand that when this was written that that would have made total sense for the Brahmins and, and you know, priestly people that were practicing yoga at that time. As a spiritual practice, celibacy would have made much more sense. But it doesn't make sense for the average person or for the householder. Um, it's, it's one of the yamas that I feel has sort of a grown as the culture shifted. So I want to just reiterate that the original meaning could well have meant celibacy, abstaining from sex, nothing, nada, <laughs> right? But we can interpret that differently now so that we can apply it uh, in a way that makes sense to modern life. So rather than being celibacy or abstinence, let's think of it as a, a removing distractions or refocusing our attention. There are a couple of things, uh, ways that I've heard it described. Also not allowing central pleasures, not allowing uh, with, with central pleasures, whether that's sex, food, alcohol, drugs, not allowing them to control us. That doesn't mean they don't have a Maybe not drugs, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that any of these things don't have a part in a, in a healthy, balanced life. We have sex, we drink, smoke a bit of weed. <laughs> I don't know what your thing is, but you can do all of that and enjoy it as part of, um, you know, a balanced life, whatever. But as soon as they start controlling you, that's when the power dynamic has totally changed and that's where the problems are going to start. So. We look at Brahmacharya as a way of um, taking the, the central focus away from those central pleasures and redirecting that energy into something more valuable. Whether that's, uh, you know, I don't know what it might be, yoga, yoga in this case, <laughs> yoga practice, spiritual practice, uh, another form, another sort of outlet, you know. You don't want to be ruled by your desires. That's the way I like to see Brahmacharya. You don't want to be ruled by them. There's space for them, but you don't want them to take control of you. And that's when stuff like, for, for me, my eating disorder went rampant, um, alcoholism, drug addiction, all kinds of addiction actually really sort of pop up when, when you start to get this dynamic a little bit skewed. And uh, I was actually reading a book the other day and I rec recommend it at the end, Brahmacharya. Uh, in the sense of the digital age as well. I thought that was quite interesting. So removing distractions and redirecting focus as well as sensual pleasures, how can we implement that in the digital age? So how can we not be like sucked into Instagram one minute, four hours later realize we've been scrolling all that time? Like how can we apply this to the way we interact with our technology? I don't have any answers. These are just questions, just things to think about in terms of each of the Yamas. Um, so yeah, just to recap, because this one's a little bit uh, confusing, perhaps it did mean abstinence to begin with, so refraining from sex, but nowadays more commonly translated into removing distractions, redirecting energy, um, not being overwhelmed by sensual pleasures, and then channeling that focus into something else, something a little bit more worthwhile perhaps. All right, last one, Aparigraha. And I, I don't think I have a quote for this one. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't have a quote for this one. So, Aparigraha, non-greed or non-possessiveness. This one's difficult. This one's really tricky. We are attached to things. <laughs> we live in a capitalist society where stuff is given a lot of value. 
over relationships, over experiences. You want the new, I sound old now, I don't know. I'm 27, but I sound a lot older now, moaning like this. But uh, you want the new phone, you want the new shoes, you want the new clothes. Uh, we live in a capitalist society where stuff is given a lot of value. And Aparigraha, again, the pronunciation, apologies if I've got that wrong, um, is about breaking the attachment we have to our things, whether that's physical or emotional. So physical is, is an easy one to kind of get your head around. Hoarding, you know, is not good. Hanging on to remnants of the past, like maybe your ex and you went on holiday and you've still got those holiday photos tucked away, maybe it's time to let it go. <laughs> not feeling secure unless you have your stuff there, so not feeling like you have value unless you have the latest shoes or the latest phone. This is a problem, our value gets tied up in our stuff, all right? So this Yama is all about breaking that attachment and realizing that we have value, whether we're wearing the latest designer gear or whether we're not. <laughs> So on a physical sense, it makes, you know, it's quite easy to wrap your head around, but what about on an emotional sense as well? What do you hold on to? What clutter do you hold on to emotionally that's causing you grief? Past relationships. Remembering an argument you had a couple of weeks ago and you wish you would have said this instead. That's all clutter. That's all emotional clutter. Um, that we need to somehow get rid of. And part of this is to practice yoga in all of its sense to try and help uh, break our attachment to this emotional and, and physical stuff that we carry around. And if you carry around a lot of emotional stuff, you're gonna see it manifest in the body somehow. So if you're stressed about something you've been holding on to, shoulders go like this and you start to walk a little bit tighter and everything's very uncomfortable. Um, same with me, if I get stressed, it's my jaw clench my jaw like that and it's no surprise that the place I injure the most is my neck. You feel it in your practice, right? Uh, when you get on the mat and everything just, you've had a hard day and everything just feels stiff and heavy and tense. And it's nice, you know, a physical practice can undo some of that stress that we carry around with us as well as the spiritual and the emotional practice. So this yama is very complex. It's about not tying our uh, identity, our self-worth um, up with the physical and emotional clutter we carry around with us, all right? So yeah, I feel like that's it. This is a very sort of quick overhaul. Like I said, you can be going through these for a very long time. I still love talking about them because every time I talk about them, something new pops up. So just, I will just recap very, very quickly what we've spoken about. So the Yamas, you have Ahimsa, non-violence, non-harm, Satya, truthfulness, Asteya, non-stealing, Brahmacharya, celibacy, or the redirecting of focus, as it's more commonly known now, and Aparigraha, non-possessiveness or non-greed. So Ahimsa, we spoke about it, non-violence towards others, non-violence towards yourself, whether that's in action or thought. Um, the fact that Ahimsa is political, so that we need to be working to better everybody's circumstances, not just our own, and the fact that Ahimsa doesn't necessarily mean veganism, all right? Satya, honesty, truthfulness in our practice, in our speech, um, sat you as a restraint, so not actively going out to spout your truth and telling everyone what you think of them, but as a restraint. Always be honest in a, in a very well-spoken way, if it's non-harmful, so in a compassionate way, and checking your intentions when it comes to Satya. Why are you telling the truth right now? Is it to benefit yourself, or is it to actually benefit somebody else? Is it to hurt someone, or is it to help them? So that's really important with, with Satya. A stayer, non-stealing, not stealing other people's stuff, obviously, but also not stealing their time, not stealing their energy, really important. Relationships with a stayer, making sure that it is 50-50, or if it's 80-20, that you're, you're, you're giving and taking, all right, on an equal, equal level. That's really important for a stayer. Brahmacharya, abstinence, we spoke about, might have made sense back in the old days for the Brahmins, the priests, not so much anymore. So Brahmacharya, not allowing your sensual pleasures to get the better of you. Alcohol, sex, food, 
all have a place in a healthy, balanced life, but only if that balance, that dynamic is right. It's about redirecting your focus and channeling the energy you feel rather than indulging, overindulging in any of those things that leads to addiction in, in healthy, uh, meaningful outlets. <laughs> All right, fabulous. Last one we just spoke about, Api Rigraha. So non-greed, non-possessiveness, whether it's to your physical stuff or your emotional stuff. So hoarding, emotional clutter, that person you broke up with three years ago, you don't need the holiday photos, you don't need the thoughts, doesn't matter if you had a row with someone a week ago or what you said, let it go, all right? Don't tie your self-worth up in your stuff is another important point with this one as well. You are worthy no matter what stuff you have. <laughs> Again, it's not about the shoes you wear or the phone you have. All right, I feel like we covered it. Beautiful. Okay, so I hope you found this valuable. I feel like it's been good to chat. Again, sometimes it's easier to do this when there's a actual communication going on. <laughs> sometimes it's easy to trip up over your words when you're trying to explain it like I am, just sitting in front of the camera. But I do hope it's made sense, uh, especially with the recaps I've done as well. And I just wanna quickly show you a couple of books that you can read about this if you're interested. So obviously we've spoken about the Yoga Sutras of Pat and Jali. Big text, absolutely 100% you need to read it if you wanna deepen your knowledge of yoga. We spoke about it a bit in the beginning. So my translation and commentaries by someone called Sri Swami Satchidananda. Sri Swami Satchidananda. All right, but there are different um, translations as well. So don't think you need to get exactly the same book as this. There are lots of translations of this text. Either way, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is backwards, but you can see what it looks like. All right, so that's number one. And this is where the system of Ashtanga Yoga is outlined. That's Ashtanga Yoga, the system by Patanjali, not Ashtanga Vinyasa, the, the postural work sequence created by Patabi Choi's. Another book, probably my number one book when it comes to talking about the yamas and niyamas, and we're gonna talk about the uh, niyamas next week, is Greed, Sex and Intention. Living Like a Yogi in the 21st Century by Hannah Whittingham and Marcus Vader. Okay, and this is actually really, again, that's what it looks like, that's the color of it, I know you can't see the text. But um, this is actually where, probably the book that's made me think most about the yamas and niyamas and how they're just full of contradictions sometimes and how they can be really difficult to understand and is a lie a lie is the truth the truth or does it change depending on the situation the context and what does it mean to apply these ancient principles to modern day life what does it mean to deny sensual pleasures and find something else to refocus on or what does it mean to to do all this in a digital age where everything's so fast paced. I 100% recommend this book, probably my favorite book on the Yamas and Niyamas. So another book that's very helpful is Living the Sutras by Kelly Donado, Amy Pierce Hayden. As far as I'm aware, I haven't looked at this one for a little while. There we go, <laughs> my camera's out of focus. But as far as I'm aware, this is more like a uh, workbook, which is really nice. Yeah, it is. So it gives you exercises. It kind of talks about the yamas and the yamas as well as other aspects. It gives you stuff to reflect on. You go away, you do quite a lot of journaling with it. Um, I haven't worked through it myself, but I have read it. So I thought this one could be quite helpful if you're looking for more information and you're looking for practical suggestions of how to implement everything we've spoken about. And this, Teaching Yoga Beyond the Poses by Sage Roundtree and Alexandra DeSato. This is a resource for teachers, okay? So this is a practical workbook for integrating themes, ideas, and inspiration into your class. Now, if you're a teacher and you're looking to introduce the yamas and the yamas into your classes, but you're not quite sure how to do it, this is incredible. This has chapters of how you could introduce these themes, what postures, could match up with, you know, the yama you're talking about. So yeah, uh, songs, chants, quotes, mantras that relate to each of the theme as well. Ideas for what happens when you're opening a class, closing a class, during moments of silence, what happens if things don't go quite right, as they often don't. <laughs> so yeah, I really recommend this book if you are a teacher and you're looking to integrate 
uh, the armors and the armors into your boss. All right. Okay, well, that's me done. If you've got any questions, just let me know. I've explained things to the best of my ability, but there are plenty of helpful resources out there. Just Google Anger Yoga, Google the Yamas, and there are incredible resources, incredible books, incredible podcasts, explaining them all in a bit more detail. Right, so that's me done. And next week, we're going to be talking about the knee armors, which are the five moral do's, the observances. So today we spoke about the restraints. Next week, we're going to talk about the observances. So today, the don'ts. Next week, the do's. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for joining me. And I'll see you when I see you uh, next. <laughs>